The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Today's message is part four of how do I do that? Come on, be honest. Those of you that have been in the church a long time, it's very easy to preach on what you should do. It's a little bit different to preach on how do I do that. As a matter of fact, we purposely ask everyone in this local congregation who are well-trained, well-equipped, that when you go and hear a guest speaker somewhere or you go to a conference and they get done telling you something phenomenal, full of wisdom and revelation, ask them, how do you do that? We need the wisdom of application, don't we? We don't just need knowledge. Knowledge can puff up, but love will build up. And love is the application, or wisdom is the application of knowledge. So, Father, help us all. I want to continue to grow. I've been in ministry for 45 years, and I still want to grow in the how-tos. I want to make it applicable so that when someone hears the Word of God, they go, well, how do I do that? Did you ever have somebody come up to you when you were at a low point and say, I just have faith? My first question, okay, show me how you do that. Show me, well, just just forgive. Okay, well, show me how you do that. Forgiveness should be as simple as breathing, and emotional healing should be as easy as breathing for a believer. Do you know that uh, with all of the types of counseling we have, and thank God for all of it, because there's some people that wouldn't be around today if it wasn't for certain kinds of counseling, Christian counseling, secular counseling, Uh, They wouldn't be with us today. But Jesus has a better approach, that in him, he's the only one that can take your pain and your sorrow. Medication can subdue it. Good understanding can help you understand why you're doing some of the things you're doing, maybe teach you to cope. But in reality, only my Jesus can take away your pain and your sorrow. And uh, it's part of his ministry. He said... Jesus said, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted. That's really a primary part of his passion for us, and then he wants to get it through us, right? So part four, how do I do that? Well, I'm going to start where we left off and and do a little refresher because it's, it's important to know these things, that you hear the terminology and you can be in the church and develop Christianese, right? It's like a foreign language. You get someone coming out of our culture now and it would be like Gentiles listening to Jewish believers. They'd be like, what does that mean? How do you do that? So we're going to try to cover some of that and give us some understanding. And for my phone counselors, this will be, hopefully this will be troubleshooting because you get people from around the world, some of them, even their English isn't that good, uh, and they're not that articulate, but they got real pain, and we need to break it down to the level. Matter of fact, uh, uh, I used to regularly uh, meet with little children and do ministry with them. And we taught over at uh, ministry schools for children. And it was funny, the, the professional counselors a lot of times would say, oh, we don't do children because they couldn't understand the methodology. Well, if our methodology is so complicated that a child couldn't understand it, I think we're missing something. That may be good for adults, but at the same time, I believe that if you can minister Jesus effectively to children or a Rhodes Scholar, then you've got, you've, got, you've got the proper bringing them back to the simplicity that's in Jesus. As a matter of fact, in the early years, that was the argument against even Christian counseling. The argument was, we have Jesus now, why do we need that? Well, because we've got Jesus, but not everybody knows how to go to him. And part of what we're trying to train people in is actually even bringing them into the place to where they have their own experience. We even teach deliverance, self-deliverance. If you're a believer and you've got Jesus on the inside of you, you ought to learn how to deal with your own issues, close those doors, and get deliverance. We're more accustomed to looking for someone to do it to us rather than us learning how to 
apply ourselves. There's three, three um, how do you do that? There's three rules, uh, three keys, not rules, uh, three keys that when Jennifer and I traveled church to church and we saw different flavors of, of need, but pretty much the church needs emotional healing. And uh, the, the thing that we saw that the three keys that are evident, and I'd write these down because if you have questions in this area, you will have difficulty moving to another level in Jesus, getting set free from what ails you. The first key is location. We were shocked going to churches. They couldn't locate their basic spiritual anatomy. But the only thing everybody knew was where their thoughts were. <laughs> All right? Your thoughts are up here. Okay? But that location, 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 it's just like real estate. If that's still the rule in real estate, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, it certainly is in, in uh, understanding your spiritual anatomy. Here's where your thoughts are, yes. But here is the seat of the emotions, the belly, the gut, the bowels, the womb. All of those are used in the scripture in defining the heart, the hidden person of the heart. And location, understanding where your will is. I was shocked how many people in large congregations would point here and say, where's your will? That's your chooser. No, that's where you give consent, where you yield your will is in the gut. And the emotions here. And quite frankly, your conscience is down here. All of this, by, well, your emotions particularly to the left vagus nerve, inform your brain. It goes down up. People used to say, i got to get that word down into my spirit. Well, you need to get it in your spirit and then inform your brain is really the way it works. Uh, the location is primary. You've heard this in part one, two, and three, hopefully. This is part four. <laughs> now, location comes next, and we saw that your value system was the second most important thing. If you saw yourself less than, very often you would just buy into that and say, well, that's the way I am. And, and the need for change is not obvious. The, uh, your value system is based on the new creation or your value system is based on the cultures brainwashing you or as you grew up, what you taught yourself or what others taught you, that it's in a derogatory way, not God's best. Your value system has to be based on the Word of God. And to the degree your value system is based on the Word of God and the new creation reality, otherwise most of the dysfunction, you got that yourself by believing the world, the flesh, and the devil. So location, value system, and then every now and then, a very small percentage of people, I do not see change. When we went church to church, we saw the vast majority could make a significant change to where the leadership even noticed the change in them and wanted to know, what happened to you? Jennifer is a good example of that. Her mentor was a Bible school president, a school psychologist, and a missionary of missionaries. She headed up missionary uh, ventures. And when uh, b right before I married Jennifer, I met her and Jennifer was teaching, and she would interrupt her teaching and correct her. And quite frankly, from my biblical perspective, she didn't need correction. Uh, and she c came and told me before we got married, uh, actually, Jennifer is brilliant, but she's too emotionally damaged to ever be used much. Bible school president. Too emotionally damaged to ever be used. If you form your theology based on your failures, that's what you come up with. Because she never saw, as a psychologist, a whole lot of results. But God had a different plan. He took this South Chicago kid who just trusted in God, and I had mental health, Christian counselors, sending them to me to my house because I only saw results. 
if people would follow instructions. I only saw results. So Jennifer went from her mentor being one who didn't see many results, therefore formed the theology. Unless you're pretty well balanced when you get saved, you're only going to go so far. If there's any of that in my listening audience, you better die to that right now. You need to repent of that false. God didn't make anybody like that. Now you have some dysfunction. You made that yourself. Or other people helped along the way, but nonetheless, you responded to it. You take personal responsibility for it. But I saw people helped all the time. I mean, I have people at mental health sent to me, and I don't recommend mental health sending me any people right now. I've got enough people trained here to do that for me. I don't need to do that anymore. But the troubleshooting that I learned, I passed on to them. And we have so many capable people right now, and I'm so pleased with them. But it was the fact that I would just say, God, help. This person's hurting. Help. And anything that I learned in that helping began to be a troubleshooting of how do you do that? How do you do that to help someone else? Remember that thing. And in my first pastorate, I did everybody. Everybody. One-on-one. -on -one. I spent most of my life one-on-one -on -one appointments. Most of my Christian life was spent one-on-one -on -one appointments. And then we traveled, and we saw, oh, my first church was pretty healthy compared to what I'm seeing out here. It's just like, I think they need some one-on-one. -on -one. So we would set up one-on-one -on -one appointments. But we had to teach the same three elements. Location, where does that happen in you? How can I cooperate with that? And secondly, your value system. And you've got to start believing that what God said about you. We used to use that expression over and over again. I'm, I'm an original. I'm a one of a kind. That makes you extremely valuable. And I want you to see yourself as beautiful as God saw you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He knew you. The scripture said that. Before you were formed in your mother's womb. You didn't have a chance to get dysfunctional. You had to wait till much later to mess up. But God saw this beautiful man or woman, uh, boy or girl, he saw you so wonderfully beautiful before you were formed in your mother's womb, and then he knit you together in your mother's womb. And to this day, now as a believer, he wants to untie any of the knots. Now, who do you think would be the most efficient at untying a knots? Now, Jennifer scored so high as a psychologist, she could be on the board of psychology in any state in the union, regardless of their criteria. And when she found, when we got married, she said, disciple me. And I taught her what I did all by myself with other people. But what I didn't know is she was documenting it all. <laughs> and she documented every one of our books it has been birthed out of the documentation that Jennifer did and me facilitating healing. And in less than 60 days, that's why we have a 60-day challenge that everybody should know. Even if it takes you more than 60 days to do it, so what? But in less than 60 days, she went back and saw her mentor, and her mentor just uh, wept at the, at the change. What happened to you? Because she was written off as too emotionally damaged. I can't write anybody off as too emotionally damaged. Your emotions belong to God, and if you would give them to him properly through a genuine work of the cross and the powers of repentance and forgiveness, you would be transformed. He's the only one that can do anything about it. And if, and if your method is so complicated that a child can't understand it, perhaps you're too complicated. Need a little more Jesus, a little less method. And the last effort... It's the third point, effort. The only people we saw that didn't make progress, and it's a small percentage really, very small, were the ones that would not apply themselves. To this day, we see people come, and they would like to get ministry, and they get help. But as soon as you put even marginal homework, even easy-to-do reading, short, brief, no overwhelming homework, and if you can't do the homework, your lack of effort shows that you probably stay the same. You need to understand the location, where, where the parts are, where is the God tools that are involved. Your value system has to be that I, I'm valuable because God said so. It has nothing to do with other people or what I even think of myself. If you want to know the purpose of a thing, never ask the thing. 
always go to the Creator. And God's got a beautiful, He sees you beautiful before you were formed in your mother's womb and you were a one of a kind. There never was another you. There never will be another you. That's the person that God says, I planned a, 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 something for them individually that nobody else can do but them. Nobody else can be but them. So why would you even want to be like somebody else and die a copy when you're an original? <laughs> so anyway, uh, I want to continue where, where we left off. Uh, your spiritual rebirth is reconnecting with God. You're reconnecting. And if you ever want to make progress in your Christian walk, you have to know how to connect with God through being born again, but then how to reconnect Him when you kind of go astray. The flesh lusts against the spirit, so they will be in conflict. But you're a new creation. Even when we used to uh, minister to people and they would, they'd be hurting, and they go, uh, oh, uh, we would pray and say, what's the situation? What's the first person or situation? Uh, well, I was abused as a child. I was abused. Oh, I don't want to go there. Okay. When a person says, I don't want to go there, what they're saying is, part of me came to get ministry, so that part of me was the new creation in me that loved God, loves his word, and wanted help. But then when I had to face it, I'm not ready to go there yet. Okay? That's your flesh part. We say, the flesh doesn't want to deal with it. The spirit, the real you, does. Agree with the part of you that's real. <laughs> all right? Don't agree with that naysayer, that flesh that wants to avoid all conflict and doesn't want to feel any pain. We even had a, a, uh, a genius uh, marketer who uh, uh, worked for several uh, large ministries that you'd be familiar with. And uh, he, he saw that Jennifer and I, he says, without me, Jennifer would have had nothing to write, but without her, nothing would have ever been written. I never trained anybody in my first pastorate. I did it all. And you know what? Some people, some Christians like that if you do it all. They would like you to just go like this and they'd be okay. No effort on their part. So the three keys to really receiving quality change in your life is first of all, know the location of where, this, where your parts are so that you can function out of the right part. And understand the, the heart. And the heart is not this blood pumper. There's only one scripture in the entire Bible that really refers to the heart, and that's men's hearts will fail for fear. Fear can give you a heart attack, all right? But your heart is the innermost being, the gut, the belly, the epicenter, all right? And we'll talk about that later. But right now, uh, through the spiritual birth, I connected with God. So how do I get reconnected? with God when I blow it. It's going to be forgiveness. Forgiveness is a beautiful gift that when he washes you, you get back into fellowship with him and with one another. Um, <clears throat> because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, man has now experienced spiritual rebirth and enjoy. I've got ten pages of notes that I want to do, and I'm on half page half of page one. So we're going to wing it today, I think, is what I think. Um, but uh, we used to get someone, who could I have to come up here? Connie, you want to come up here? I want to show you what we used to do when we traveled in churches, this troubleshooting that really worked. We'd have a person uh, say, poor Connie here, she was going up for the altar to get saved every week. Every week. So I'm saying there's something wrong with the location, the equipment, the understanding, what have you. So what I would do is I'd have them put their hand right here, the seat of the emotions. Every thought has a corresponding emotion. We've covered that. Now, I would say, all right, we want to find out if she's really saved. You know, salvation is a supernatural exchange or a supernatural transaction. It's not about 
I said the right prayer in my head, so therefore I'm saved. Here's the way you can tell that your spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. How many know that scripture? Your spirit bears witness. That means there's an awareness that is spiritual, that there was a supernatural exchange. So here's what I would do. I would say down here, good or bad. I don't, don't try to get them uh, to, to be too sensitive to various emotions because a lot of people have suppressed them for so long. Uh, they just say frustrated. All right. But I would say this now, Connie. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me that I should be called a child of God. How did that feel? Good yes. or bad? Good. It felt good. Mm -hmm. That's the assurance of your salvation. And people go, well, you got to go by faith and not by feelings. Faith is assurance. It's an inner knowing. It's an inner confidence. It's a title deed that I have what I don't see, but I have it now. I have an assurance. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed. And she says, yeah, feels kind of uncomfortable. You know what I would do? I'd lead them to the Lord right there. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Cleanse you of your sin. And she's yielding so beautifully right now. And Connie doesn't have this trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what happened to her. Look at location. Let's go to location. When, say she was going to the altar all the time, but now she's got an assurance, and she could say, she'll probably say something like this. You've heard this. You've maybe said it yourself. I know that I know. I know in here that I know. I know that I know. I know that I know. Why? Because you're, the, all inner knowings are spiritual of either seeing, hearing, or feeling in the spirit to inform this knower. You live from your heart, informs your head. Your conscience, what if she blows it, does something wrong? Down here, it'll go. <clears throat> now, you have to pay attention to that buzzer because if you ignore it often enough, uh, you won't feel it anymore. It's like putting a pillow on the alarm clock or something. You put enough pillows on it, you won't hear it anymore. Okay? So obedience has a way of purifying that whole thing. Now, we would also say um, that the Spirit himself is bearing witness with our spirit that we are a child of God. So now I have an assurance, right? Okay. Okay, uh, up, stay up here because you're going to be another person here. You're, uh, you're a, a, a nervous, nervous Nelly, all right? And people are telling you, you need to pray and read your Bible. And you go, oh, I know, I know, I know, I need to pray and I, I need to re read my Bible, okay? But the flesh lusts against the spirit, Galatians 5, 17. The flesh lusts against the spirit. So part of you wants to pray and part of you can't sit still. What part are we going to agree with? The part that wants to pray. The real you that loves God and loves his word. All right, so now I want to calm our soul. This was step one. And everybody that we ever trained had to learn to do this. Because your mind, now what, look where I'm pointing, your will, that's the door of the heart. Your emotions, this is the seat of the emotions. Left vagus nerve. Whatever you feel down here goes up and informs your head to the emotional center in the brain. And we've used this illustration again and again. If all of a sudden we heard a loud crash, boom, what was that? That crash, emotion would cascade through our entire body before this head would catch up and say, oh, that must have been something in the hallway that fell. Right? The emotions... Emo cognition, emo volition. The emotions control your thinking and the emotions control your choices. But the church has taught for years, just ignore those emotions. Well, emotions don't die. They get buried alive. And you can, with your mind and your will, how many of you have done this? You wanted to do something emotionally, like punch somebody, and you went, no, that wouldn't be proper. I'm not going to do it. You can override it, but guess what? When you walk away, that anger has been suppressed. It's still there, and it's going to pop up later, and you're going to be real surprised when it pops up at an inconvenient time. Kick the dog or whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
All right, now we're going to calm her soul now that she's nervous, Nelly. All right. And the scripture that, that works the best for this was David himself said in Psalm 131 2, Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. That was relaxing just to hear that. Huh? All right, so like a weaned child. So she's going, my mind is going all over the map. I'm sitting down to pray, but I'm thinking I need to do this, and then I got to go this, and then I got to pick up the dry cleaning, and then I'm going to do that. What you do is you write that stuff down and say, I'll do it later. Right? That's all you got to do. All right? But in the meantime, the mind, the will, and the emotions, your soulish nature, wars against the spirit, doesn't it? It wars against the spirit. We want the spirit to win, right? We want the new creation to win. So when it's warring, the mind, the will, and the emotions have to be calmed. So what do I do? I'm going, if you sit there and you submit to God, eventually those three bad kids, mind, will, and emotions, they don't get annihilated, they don't get destroyed, they suddenly sink into and the spirit rises up and you are calm. And then you are actually, for the first time, really connecting. Prayer is being with someone. Prayer is not just doing. Prayer is being before it's doing. So now you're, you're in the presence of God. You're connected to him. And you've calmed and quieted your spirit. I bet everybody in our church doesn't need this instruction. They know how to quiet their flesh, to be still and get into his presence. But the vast majority do not. The vast majority... Matter of fact, some have to pray in the spirit and or do something almost till they get tired before they can sit down and get still in, in the presence of the Lord. But as long as you get in the presence of the Lord, but you can get there quicker or you can take, you know, it's like going to California. You can take a plane or you can take a wagon train. Personally, I'd rather take the plane than the wagon train. All right. You're still resting and secure. Okay. All right, so now the world, the flesh, and the devil is trying to connect with, with uh, Connie, and she's saying, I don't want that. I want us to be still. Okay, I think you can sit down because you're going to get tired standing. You did good. We know you're saved now, <laughs> for sure. All right? But when the voice... And the world around you, it says, don't be conformed to that world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can read those things and not know how to do it, right? How do I do that? Well, there, there's a voice of the world, the voice of your flesh, voice of the devil. And what he's trying to get you to do is three stages. Write these down because this is a real helpful tool. He tries to <clears throat> connect with you. Oh, isn't that nice? The devil wants to connect with you. <laughs> the world wants to mold you into its own image. It wants you to be politically correct. It wants you to just mouth the, the narrative that you hear, whether you know, understand it or not. It wants to connect. And it will, it will seduce you. It will find you. It will repeat itself until you do what? The next step. You own it. And once you own it, here's, here's the little, call it a formula if you want, but it's the way the spirit works. Connect, own, express. Connect, own, and express. There's voices of the world. Uh, Isaiah says there's a voice from the city, the voice from the temple, and then there's the voice of God, which also means the voice of God is not necessarily always the voice coming from the temple. Jesus learned that, didn't he? What was coming from the Pharisees was not necessarily the voice of God. All right? So there's a voice of religion. There's all kinds of voice. But your obligation is to say that I want to connect with God. I want to be known and owned by God. And then when I express it, I'm going to express his character. Anybody can get, quote scriptures and give lip service to it, but a transformed life is noticeable to people. People will go, man, I remember Jennifer when she was such an emotional wreck. I figured, you know, she's never going to amount to anything. Smart, but 
not going to amount to anything. She's too emotionally damaged. Hmm. Interesting. I saw a world-class teacher when I saw Jennifer and we, before we were married. And I saw her mentor, not so world-class, but very knowledgeable. See, world-class, by my terminology, is spirit insight, spiritual knowledge. And real spiritual knowledge has to be a supernatural transaction, a supernatural exchange, like being born again. Otherwise, it's information. And the church is loaded with people with information, but not necessarily has it come into the place of transformation. God wants you to hear his word, a matter of fact, here's the way we taught Jennifer, and this is the way she does it as well to this day. When we read the scriptures, we read and feed at the same time. My intellect reads the words on the page, but my spirit opens up to absorb the reality. I want to meet the author. I don't want ink on a page. I want the spiritual reality. So when I read, I open my heart. You can do the same thing. Read... If you're proud of your intellect and you think you're pretty sharp mentally, the tendency will be to just rely upon that because you relied upon that in the world before salvation. But God's looking for someone that will calm their soul like a weaned child, saying, my mind, will, and emotions are like, uh, uh, I want them to be not obliterated, but yielded and surrendered like a sail on a sailing ship so that the wind of the Spirit can blow freely through them. I want to be usable. I want my mind, will, and emotions to be usable by the Holy Spirit. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are better than my ways, his choices. And his emotions, he's love. And he's not going to, and I want his emotions, not my emotions. And by the way, for all that bad teaching some of us older people got about the emotions, you don't need those emotions, ignore those emotions. Why did God make you a thinking, feeling, choosing being if he didn't want all three to be under the lordship of Jesus? He wouldn't have given you emotions if they didn't serve a purpose. And you know what the purpose is? He wants you to actually, oh, here comes that bad word, feel love, joy, peace. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Do you realize all three of those are emotional? And some would say, well, not not righteousness, joy and peace, yeah. No, righteousness is emotional too because it's love and action. Righteousness under the new covenant is love and action. So it's love, joy, peace. The kingdom of God is coming from an emotional God. And he gave you emotions for him to flow through those conduits. Not for you to ignore, suppress stuff. Now... When we talk a lot about emotions, the men get upset because that's a woman thing. Only women have those. You know, well, Jennifer said, yeah, but I've seen you men on the road, and you've got some other emotions, too. I've seen you. <laughs> you what you mean is you might not have any good ones. <laughs> All right. But nevertheless, in ministering to a man, I don't even use the word emotion, in ministering to a man one-on-one, -on -one, stress. Oh, yeah, they, I haven't met a man yet that didn't understand stress. Well, guess what? Stress is to be, by definition, emotionally controlled by people or circumstances. You are emotionally controlled. Come on, men. You want to be controlled? How many want to be controlled by something other than God? Nobody wants that. All right? Now, here's, here's what we've used for training that has been uh, invaluable. We took a scripture that people are familiar with, but we took it out of the message translation. And it's uh, <clears throat> uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. Now, we know that as the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments or high things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God are spiritual weapons. Listen to this in the message, and it gives you exactly what we end up doing with people to see transformed lives, to see quality. How do you do that? This scripture lays out part of the way it does. It says, we use our powerful God tools. That's a different way of saying weapons of warfare. 
we use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies. That's the voices that are coming from the world, the flesh, and the devil. We smash those. That's philosophy. I want the Word of God. I want the living Word. So we have these powerful God tools, and what do they do? They'll smash those lies. They'll tear down barriers we've erected against God. Walls. And God will fit every... Here's those three bad boys again. This is your soulish nature. This is wars against the Spirit. He will fit every loose thought, emotion, and choice. Now it says... Every loose thought, emotion, and impulse, which is your choice. Every loose thought, emotion, and impulse into a structure. God's building something in you. Into a life. He wants to build a life, but he needs your impulses. He needs your choices. He needs your emotions, and he needs your mind. And he wants to build something. And these tools are ready and at hand. Oh, see, and this is another emphasis we have. That's not popular. You can do this yourself. You don't need Joe Heavy Speaker to do it all the time. I know you've been trained to go to the expert to get something done to you, but God says, you know what? I, I'm the expert. I'd like to train you. Are you willing? That's called discipleship compared to getting born again and then camping out there the rest of your life looking for help from other people. Hmm? Now, not that you don't need help from other people. Most of you do. Look in the mirror. And say, I need other people. God, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus said so. All right. But in a healthy way. Now, he takes every loose thought, emotion, and impulse into a structure. Our tools are ready at hand, meaning it's available. You don't have to run conference to conference to find somebody. You can go to your prayer closet and go to Jesus. You can go directly to him. And he's, they're ready at hand. They're in you. It's just a question of will you apply effort. Remember we said the weakness in people receiving was they didn't know how to locate their, in their anatomy. Their value system was that's just the way I am, so they get lazy. And the lack of effort that follows suit. You can't make somebody do it by going like this, waving your hand over that and assuming that everything's done. But God says that Every obstruction, I want to build a life of obedience to maturity. Is maturity part of God's plan? He doesn't want you to stay on milk forever. He wants you full stature. Where do we get that name for this ministry, full stature? That means grow up. That means no baby food. huh? Because we'll teach you how to go from milk to meat. But you have the capacity in you to respond rather than just react. Now, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, we know that this God's taken this mind, will, and emotions, and he's trying to put it together. And I'm on page two, by the way, my 10 pages of notes that I wanted, I wanted to cover today. So it must have to be a part five. <laughs> no, 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 no. Now, anyway, but Hebrews 4, 12. How many are familiar with that verse? The word of God is quick and powerful sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides asunder between soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. What this reveals... No, we don't have our chiropractor with us today. He would like this. It's all about alignment. <laughs> right? It reveals non-alignment. That word is a living word. That's not ink on a page. Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick and powerful. We already said it's a living Word. This is Jesus, Jesus in the Word. We did that last week. It reveals non-alignment. So pay attention to this. What non-alignment is that Scripture doing? Soul from spirit. This is how we're supposed to be reading this Word so that it discerns us. As it's discerning us, it's saying that's flesh, that's spirit. Here's where you're not aligned. Joe, Sally, Ralph, Betty. In your individual prayer time, here's where there's not a lineup. That's flesh, that's spirit. Choose spirit. 
and then he puts it together again to make it useful. Now, the second non-alignment uh, is joints and marrow. Joints and marrow is you say you're aligned with God, it's these Christians I can't stand. All right, God will reveal non-alignment. That how can you say you love God and you can't love the people around you? The Word of God will reveal joints and marrow where you're not connected, where you don't belong. People say, well, I don't have to belong to be a Christian. No, you don't. It couldn't be just you and God. But you, can, uh, you could be married and not go home. But I think in time, the relationship will suffer. <laughs> so it's not a question of a Christian can do anything. And they can have anything they want. They can have demons if they want them. All right? So, non-alignment will be revealed, your flesh from the spirit. Non-alignment will be revealed in your relationships with people. Joints and marrow. And then it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It will reveal non-alignment with God where you're double-minded. Where you're unstable. You're not really responding to his initiative. You're responding to your own likes and dislikes. And then even put a little Christianese on there, respond to your own selfish likes and dislikes and say, God told me. Or, I have a peace about that. No, you have a lust about that. That's not peace. <laughs> I want what I want and I want it now and it sure feels good. Yeah, that feel-good part can be lust. You're looking for peace, the supernatural power of peace. Your spirit is God-conscious, your soul is self-conscious, and your, your body is world-conscious of donuts. I see the sign donuts, and I'm being drawn away. Somebody ought to buy me donuts sooner or later. It's the same old sermon illustration you get every time. So I think I need to pray that through myself. <laughs> But anyway, can you see the non-alignment? I want to calm your soul, get that mind, will, and emotions down there where it belongs. But God, Satan wants to do the same thing. Think about it. Anything you read in the Bible about deliverance, the demon expresses his nature through an individual. So we can go back to the, to the way it operates, the same way God operates. Connect. Make a connection somehow until you own it. That's me. And then you will express it. The highest form of expression, too, for a Christian should be, like, should be challenged by Jesus' statement to Philip. Show us the Father, Philip. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Highest form of communication. That's, more, that's a higher form than words alone. Being is more important than doing. And to be an expression of him. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Jesus said. He was an expression. We need to be an expression of Jesus. How does that happen? Well, first of all, he wants to connect. Then we have to learn how to stay connected, right? Reconnect, because nobody's perfect. And then thirdly, we need to express that reality. And if it's not reality, we're not expressing. That's what Jennifer's mentor saw. She saw a changed life. She remembered Jennifer before she got married, and she saw Jennifer shortly after. And I mean a matter of weeks. And she was blown out of the water. Changed lives is what it's all about, but it requires what? Let's go back to that original little pattern that we saw over and over again, especially when we travel church to church. They have to understand where your equipment is location, how to operate and use that equipment. Then we saw <clears throat> from the place of location, <clears throat> oh boy, we saw that it <clears throat> operates out of your value system. If you have a value system that's more world than biblical, that'll need to be changed and transformed. And lastly, effort. If you're going to run around and always hope someone else is going to do for you what you should be doing for yourself, you will be very limited in, into the kind of transformed life that you'll have. 
Matter of fact, uh, we had so many people to deal with. Jennifer used to be called the homework lady. We had so many people that wanted help. Well, every, it's easy to find people that want help. It's a little harder to find people that will apply themselves, <laughs> right? I can remember the first time we had an altar call at that one church <clears throat> in Massachusetts. And they're all lined up. And I said, okay, the first person, put your hand right down here. And we're, we're going to agree that Jesus in me and the Jesus in you are going to come into a place of agreement. I came up here for you to pray for me. That verbalized what other people could think and not say. I want you to do it to me. Those are the ones that made very, very little progress, if ever. Don't be that person. Your value system and the amount of effort. Now, something that's kind of off topic, but I've got time here. I want to I wanna do this. I want to... I want to uh, pray right now and break moods. Anybody been in a mood lately? Slip up your hand here. Now, I know there's a uh, hundred times more watching on camera than are in this room, but you had moods. I want to. I want to give you some instruction on that. An emotion is an emotional healing, and it's momentarily. Moods can be something that you've carried for a long time. Hmm? And I'll give you the, the easiest illustration of moods is to get saved. When you got saved, you were in what we would call the indicative mood. The sky is blue. I've never seen the sky so blue. The grass is green. I've never seen the grass so green. Wow. I want to stay like that. Did you ever have an experience in God where you wanted to stay like that? Uh-huh. That's called, we just call that for the sake of argument. This is not uh, grammatically accurate, but I'm going to use these words just for the instruction. The indicative mood is where you want to live in God. Where the sky is bluer and grass is greener and there's spiritual reality and the spirit world's more real than the world around you. But you can appreciate the world around you. Then you go into the next mood that mood somewhere, you don't know what happened, it just went away. And all of a sudden, this is, this is good Dennis's testimony, you start beating people over the head with the Bible. You need this. You need to see the sky is bluer and the grass is greener. And your mood just changed from indicative to enjoying it to being a little on the pushy side. Ever had any Christians that are a little bit on the pushy side? Oh, they justify it because they mean well. Well, so does it in, felt like an interrogation going on sometimes. But as long as that interrogator justifies it with, this is for your own good. <laughs> All right. That mood pushy is actually you've drifted from God. Mm -hmm. And You're trying to make it happen in the flesh. Have you ever gotten frustrated in Christianity? It's probably because you're trying to make it happen in the flesh. You'd be better off getting back to that more implicit trust in God, lost in Him, and saying, oh, I am so grateful and so thankful. And everything, I'm going to give thanks. This is the will of God and Jesus. Oh, you're, you're, if you say that and you've got a clean heart, you're in the indicative mood. But then, you know what? When, if that mood leaves, then you start trying to get that mood back by getting other people to comply. That's the, what we would call the imperative mood. <laughs> a little bit imperative. You put an exclamation point after everything you say. All right? And guess what happens? Happened to me. I'm tired. I've tried. You go into the subjunctive mood. You went from, you went from good to pushy I quit Christianity. It's too hard. People don't like me and I don't like them and they're not complying either. <laughs> I quit. Have you ever done that? Ah, uh, well, that's the, what we would call the subjunctive mood. Heavy, depressed. It's like a 
cloud. Or like when I lived in Chicago, uh, when the rain would come, it would come five days in a row. And you didn't have a little Florida sunshine, then shower, then back to sunshine. Nah, 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 nah. No, it came in like a mood. And it stayed for days, maybe weeks, I don't know. But it just stayed like it was never going to stop raining. That's all it does. That's a mood. I'm depressed. I'm sad. And every place in Scripture where you saw even the men and women of God, the greats, look at Elijah as a good example of that. Call down fire! And then run from Jezebel. I just, I'm no better than my fathers. I should die. Well, just kill me, God. Come on, nobody's ever done that, right? <laughs> uh, only Elijah's done this, right? The rest of us are far too mature to, to do or say anything crazy like that, right? And then you move, and to me, this is the goal of all the prophetic that we hear. Uh, at least this is my goal. I expect it to produce in it that even in the midst of the pressure, you might even still be upset or sad to some degree, you start saying, the Lord is going to be a light to me. And there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I don't feel it yet. Some of the biggest breakthroughs I know that, uh, that I've gotten was when I felt really lousy and pressed into God. It's like there's always a light at the end of the tunnel, but you don't wait for that other thing to lift. You pursue the light. You pursue the light. He will be a light unto me. And then all of a sudden, you're in another mood. You're in the optative mood. The optative mood is... I'm hoping in God regardless of the pressure that I feel. And if you stay there a while, guess what happens? You get back into the indicative mood and the sky is blue and the grass is green and life is good. Huh? Let's pray for that right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, there are people that have been trapped and it's by the voice of the world, the voice of the flesh, and even demonic activity is playing into it. And we just command in the name of Jesus Christ to break that foul mood in the name of the Lord. My emotions belong to God. And right now I'm going to open up my heart to hope. Hope and open are synonymous. Right now I'm opening my heart that even if there's pressure on my life right now, my heart is open. My soul is open and spirit are rejoicing in Jesus and I'm giving thanks I'm not giving thanks for all the negative stuff I'm giving thanks in spite of all the negative stuff I'm giving thanks not for it but in it in it I am going to thank God I'm giving him and opening up to hope and hope does not disappoint hope defers what's made me sick and sad but hope realize is a delight and I'm going to stay open till the delight comes. And I am not going to shut down. And that is open as far as hope is. Here's the way you do hope. You open your heart and I will not shut down regardless of the pressure that's coming on me. I will not shut down. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I'm going to hold my heart open till love comes through. Faith is now. Hope is is holding the heart open. And if you do that, it won't disappoint. That means love will come through. Don't put a timetable on it, because that'll, that'll get you hope deferred. You'll shut down. And the way the Lord showed it to me is that when I open my spirit up to hope in Him, that hope that doesn't disappoint, because love is going to come through. I don't know how, and I'm not going to dictate how He has to do it or when He has to do it. But I will refuse to give up that openness until that mood changes and I'm back into the presence of God and the joy of my salvation. And as I'm holding my heart open, he gave me the picture of like, uh, I used to watch those old cowboy movies where they would always go into the mine, silver mine, gold mine, whatever kind of mine. And at the entrance of the mine, there was huge timber supporting it. And God says, you have that capacity to hold your heart open, regardless of circumstances, not open to negativity, not open to negative, but when you're open, what's, hope is guarding your heart with peace. Peace 
The enemy can't touch the fruit of the Spirit. So if you're holding your heart open, you can feel what's going on around you, but you don't have to own it. What did we say the thing was? Connect, own, and express. Well, under pressure, the only thing I'm owning is my intimacy with God until he expresses himself through me, which is what he wants to do anyway. He wants to get his personality go through you. Connect, own, and express. The devil wants to do it, and God wants to do it. Who are you going to respond to? Hmm? I say choose life. Choose God. Connect, own, and express. And uh, it was beautiful. Don Norai was one of the few people I ever heard teach on the blood, and it's the way we need to understand the blood in all three levels. Most teach on the blood is that through the blood of the cross, you got saved. But it also says that for the person in really uh, the level of the exchange life, it is no longer I that live. It says that if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another, and the blood continually cleanses. And then Jesus at the third level, ascension, he took that blood into the heavenly holy of holies. The blood still works, and it needs to work for you and with you. It would be like the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies. It was necessary in your transition, in your spiritual walk. So, Father, we thank you that you who began a good work are going to complete this good work. And uh, I really believe that the location, your value system, and the effort you apply is going to make the difference in the days ahead. Effort. You know, the handful of people uh, that have come to this church. People come and go from all churches. The ones that never did the 60-day challenge never made it, never lasted. Is that too demanding to give 60 days to God, even if you didn't do it every day? Hmm? If it took you three months, four months to do 60 days, Everybody I know, at least in this, this fellowship right here, it's, it's a, a lifestyle now. It's not just 60 days. It's the, well, that's the way you live. It gets to become part and parcel of everyday life. Everybody's head's nodding. You don't know it. All right? 60 days is for the first radical transformation. After that, it's forward and upward, victory to victory, faith to faith, glory to glory. You are to be transformed from one image to the other. And you are not to stay a baby. Father, I pray for everyone who may have fallen into that trap of getting saved and then camping out there. Assuming they've got fire insurance now, they're okay. No, there's more. Amen? Amen. 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 You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.